It's important because I think it gets confusing to students who are probably used to writing methods whose arguments and return values are primitives, things like strings or numbers. I mean, it's easy sort of to think about functions in those terms. You have a square root function, right? What does it do? You give it a number, it returns a square root, all right? Or um, any sort of functions like that, I, I think, are easier to visualize. You know, you've been doing them sort of since Excel, where you've been writing functions. Um, I think it's a little harder to visualize when you have functions that um, take and return um, objects as, as, as either arguments or return values. Or when you have instance variables that are composed of other objects. You know, remember that what you create when you create objects, that classes and objects, and when you're doing object-oriented programming is you're doing a, a sort of a model in software of the real world. And so getting back to our pizza example, what does a pizza order consist of? Well, it consists of some information about a customer, all right, and it consists of a set of pizzas, a list, if you will, of pizzas. So that's what an order consists of. It is a set of pizzas going to a customer. So therefore, rather than doing something like having in our order class the number of pizzas or so on, we actually store in there an, a, a, a pizza object, a list of pizza objects that we can add. That way we don't have to duplicate any code, because if we need to know anything about, a anything about that order's pizzas, we simply can loop through or look at the pizzas and ask the pizza a question, you know, um, that is call a method on it. So let's take a minute and look at this, and, and we'll go from there. Let me go and compile it, even though it was compiled from last time, it should be okay. One thing I do when I compile is I compile Java C and then I do asterisk.java. I guess everything um, in there. And that's what I do when I grade your stuff. Therefore, it's important to not have anything in there that's like um, not needed code because I'll try to compile it, all right? Rather than have to worry about like which one has your main method and all that, I just do Java C and compile it. It's going to do its thing. And now I can run it. And it tells me that the cost of pizza one is $12, cost of pizza two is $11, cost for the order is $25. If you remember, the cost for the um, um, order, um, if the order is for delivery, it had a $2 charge added to it. So that, that's what constitutes the difference between that. So let's look at the three classes that we have in question. Here's our order class. Oh, I'm sorry, our unit test class. Here's our order class. And here's our pizza class. Our pizza class, we have gone through this before. All right. Notice our pizza class has two constructors in it. It has one constructor that accepts three arguments, specifically a string, a string, and a boolean, and then it has a constructor that accepts no arguments. Again, the reason that we supply different constructors is to aid in the flexibility of using this class. All right. 
Typically what happens is you have a constructor that will set some properties of the object. You know, objects, classes have properties and objects have values for those properties. So in our case we have three properties. We have the size, we have the kind of crust, and we have whether or not it has pepperoni. So one of our constructor sets the values from those of those properties from the arguments. So for example, how would I create if this is our if this is our constructor arg size arg crust arg pepperoni what would be the command that we would use to create a pizza that was large, thin crust, and no pepperoni. What would that command look like? I want to create a new pizza object for large, thin crust, no pepperoni. What would that instruction look like? Pizza P equals new pizza. Very good. Is that where we leave it? All right. What do we put then? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we said large. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So in my case, if I wanted a pizza that was large, thin crust, and no pepperoni, that's what I'd say. Pizza P equals new pizza, L, thin, false. How do I know that? Well, because the constructor on the pizza class accepts, I have a constructor that ha accepts three arguments, a string, a string, and a boolean. The first string is the size, the second string is the kind of crust, and the third string is whether it has pepperoni or not. What does this statement, if you were going to explain that statement in words, what would you say? Yes. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. So to sum, I'll oh, go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. What we're doing, what both people said, uh, but to sort of summarize what they said, is we're taking the first argument. How do I know it's the first argument? Well, because arg size. I'm going to take whatever argument gets passed when I create a new pizza. So whenever I say pizza p equals new pizza, whatever I have is the first argument. Better be a string, first of all, or this is not going to compile. I'm going to take that string and I'm going to save it as the property size. All right. Why do I need to do this? Why do I have to have an argument size and then argument size equals size? How long is argument size around? What's the scope of that variable? Exactly. This argument is only around, this variable is only around inside this function. It's not an instance variable. It's not a property. So when, if we declare this argument and we give a value to it, we better save that argument somewhere, otherwise it's lost. So where are we going to save it? We're going to save it in the variable size. Now that variable size is an instance variable or a property. The word instance variable means every instance of this class has its own value for it. 
All right, so every pizza has a value for its size, and they can be different, right? You have medium, small, and large pizzas, all right? Because we need to use this throughout our, throughout our pizza class, we have to save it in a variable. We have to save it in an instance variable or property. So we take that and then put it in the variable size so that later on when we need to use a variable size, we have a value for it. Now, which one of these things co corresponds to arg size? And how do we know that that co corresponds to arg size? Right, because of the position. This is the first argument. This is the first thing in the list. So that gets put in the first thing here. These things are fundamental, I know, but they're important. And if there's any doubt at all in your mind, you're going to have a, you're going to have a harder time as we go further in this class. So I want to make sure we really understand this. All right? Now, same thing with thin and same thing with false. Now, again, because I've declared those variables a certain way, I couldn't say this. What would happen if I tried to do that? Right. It was not the right type, so we would get an error when we try to compile it. This function is expecting string, string, boolean. Well, this isn't a string, and this isn't a boolean. So it would complain about both of those things. Now, why do we have a no argument constructor? It's exactly the de the 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 one argument or the no argument constructor would be a default. In other words. And again, you could argue with if this is valid for a real pizza shop. If someone were to call in and say, I want a pizza, and then get cut off before they could tell you what kind they wanted, what kind of pizza would you assume it is? Well, I don't know if a pizza shop would assume anything. All right? But in our case, simply to illustrate how these defaults work, this is the defaults for values. We can default if it has, and we're defaulting this one to a medium, thick crust, with pepperoni. All right. How do we call that constructor? Exactly. So it would be pizza Q equals new pizza. What if the pizza shop manager came to us and said, you know, we've been sending, we've been making too many medium thick crust pizzas and when people get here we find that they don't want, want them. You know, so in other words, that's not a valid default. What would we do if we realized that there really was no default pizza that we would want to have? I don't know if that's a, a well-worded question or not. The, based on the look on people's faces, I'm thinking that that wasn't a very well-worded uh, question. Yeah, how do, yeah, exactly. How would we get rid of the default pizza? Take out the constructor without arguments. In other words, if the manager of the pizza shop said, no, what is this business of a default pizza? That doesn't make any sense. Well, then what would you do? You would get rid of that default function, the, the thing that defaults the variables. What would happen then if you tried to do this in your code? You would get a compile error because there is no default. There is no, there is no zero argument constructor. Remember, you get a zero argument constructor automatically unless you have created your own constructor. All right? Unless you've created your own constructor. All right? Now, we could, cre we could create all sorts of defaults here. For example, if the person didn't say that they wanted thin crust, maybe we could assume 
maybe we would assume that the kind of crust is, is, uh, is um, defaulted to um, um, thick. So if they don't specify the kind of crust they want, we will assume that they want thick crust. What would the constructor look for that, like for that? If we wanted to default the crust to thick unless they said. And everything else to be set by argument. Okay. Um, let me go and do that. So first of all, would we have an arg crust argument? No. So this would equal to that. This would equal to that. And if we wanted to assume that it was going to be thick crust, we would do this. And that way, we would default the argument that was missing for a certain value. So it's important to understand the way these constructors work. You have multiple constructors because sometimes you want to default values and, and sometimes you, you don't. All right? And again, this is a little bit of a contrived example. I don't know if there's such a thing as a default pizza. All right? But... Um, this would be how you would do it if there was one. All right? Questions about constructors. Now, how's a constructor different? I'm basing, some of the things I'm talking about today uh, is based on some questions that I had for some students. All right? If we set, we can set the constructor we can set these properties for a construct uh, via the constructor. Why do we still have get and set methods then? Exactly. All right. This simply gives you another way to set and to access the properties, to set and get the values of the properties. So what does a set method do? A set method takes a, the argument from, the, um, from um, whoever's calling the function and puts it in the property. All right? So you might ha you have the ability to create a pizza one way and then later on go back and change the pizza. So if I were to create a pizza and say, yes, I want a pizza, um, I want a medium thick crust pepperoni pizza, then you think and realize, oh, your vegetarian friend is over, you could say, well, all right, never mind, I don't want pepperoni on that. That way you would not have to go in and call the method uh, to recreate the pizza. You would simply call the method to say, change the value of pepperoni from that from yes to no. So we no longer want pepperoni. We could say set has pepperoni and then pass an argument of false. The get methods are used to simply return the value. We might need to print this on a receipt, for example. So we create the pizzas the way that we want to, all right? We could have a routine that says display receipt, display order. And that display order would go through and summarize, I want a large thick crust with pepperoni. I want a thin crust, medium without pepperoni, and so on. Here's the total amount. So we could have a print receipt method on here that would loop through and would display it. In order to do that, each pizza would have to be able to identify what was on it. You know, was it medium, large, or small? Was it thick crust, thin crust? Does it have pepperoni or not? Did I see someone's hand go up? Right. Yes. You could, for example, like, like, for example, like, um, um, yeah, like have a menu and like, um, um, like a lot of fast food places go. I want the, the number one combo, all right? 
And, you know, if you get the number one combo, maybe you get a burger, fries, and a medium soft drink or something like that. In which case, you could have different arguments for it. Remember, you can have as many constructors as you want, provided each constructor has a different, uh, a, a different um, um, set of arguments. All right? Different in terms of number and type. So if either the, different, the types or the number of arguments are different, then it's valid. So I could have, let's, let's, let's do this just for the heck of it, just to demonstrate how we could do this. We could have at our pizza place a number one is a large thin crust with cheese. A number two is a large, thick, with pepperoni. All right? Let's say we want to implement that. And we could, have, we could have more if we wanted to. We could have five, as you said, or however many we wanted. That way, if they order, that would make it simple. Just give me a number one. All right? And there you go. How would we implement that in code? Yes? Well, not, not from the UI perspective, but from the, con from the perspective of the constructor. Because, yeah, our UI, again, we don't talk about UIs in this class. Everything is hard-coded in our test class for now. But if we wanted to order a number one or a number two, what would we have? Okay. We could do that. All right. But... That sort of, def uh, again, if, if we did that, that would be using our existing constructors. Could we create a new constructor to make it easier to order by number? Okay. Okay. So what would the constructor look like? Public, it's going to look like this, the first part of it. But then what would that look like after that? What are we going to pass to this constructor? Pardon me? What are we going to? An integer. Arg pizza number. Now, there's no property for pizza number, right? Because that gets translated in those other properties. So we could then say if our pizza number equals 1, then what do we say? Large, thin, with cheese. All right, and if it was equal to 2, then we said large, thick with pepperoni. All right, so we could create like a sort of a specials number by doing it that way. All right, and then when we call the constructor, if they wanted a number 1, we would say, Pizza R equals new pizza. Then to make a number one, we give it a number one. To make a number two, we give it a number two. All right. Okay, enough about constructors for now. All right, we'll come back to this. Now, the one thing that we have not addressed um, anywhere in here, and I'm just letting you know that I'm aware that we haven't addressed this, and this is a big deal but we're not going to talk about it now. And that is validation. For example, um, 
there's only certain values we can give the size, right? We can only give it small, medium, or large. There's only certain values we can give the, the crust, thick or thin crust, all right? And we're not doing anything to check for those values yet, all right? Um, we will do that when we, talk, when we start talking about exceptions and tries and catches and all that. We'll be able to define exceptions so that if you try to create a pizza and give it something that isn't one of the legal values, then it will simply throw an exception that you, your code can look for and, and, and all that. Now, we'll deal with that later. Right now, we're going to behave ourselves and we're going to make sure that we give it legitimate values. Because if we didn't give legitimate values, then who knows what's going to happen, right? It would depend on how our code is written. And again, because of this, we would actually do something like this. Instead of saying size equals arg size, I would say this set size. Why? Because guess where we're going to put the validations? Right here in the set. We're going to have some code here that looks to make sure that that argument size is a valid value. And if it is a valid value, it'll let it go and process it. If it's not a valid value, it will then kick it out. There's another way we can do this for those of you that maybe have done a lot of coding in C Sharp or whatever, maybe you've taken advanced C Sharp, and that's with an enumeration. Right, you could also use an enumeration, would be another way to do it. I guess for now, I just want to point out that we're building the structure so that we can do error checking, but we're not doing the error checking right now. We're going to do the error checking later on. All right? And if we do that, then every way, if we, if we use the set method everywhere, then our validation only needs to be put in that set method, right? which goes along with our making these guys private. Because if they're private, then no code can address those values without going through the set method. And the set method has a validation, so we're, 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 we're foolproof. All right? We only allow one way to set the value of that variable. Ultimately, we have our validation there. You can't give it a value except going through that method. And therefore, the validation will kick in and will guarantee that we don't have any invalid data in there. All right. The get methods, again, will be used later on. If we had a receipt printing or something like that, we will get the values of these things. And then finally, we use the calculate to calculate the bake time and to calculate the cost. Now, the order one is a little confusing. All right, or it could be a little confusing. The new thing with this is really this. All right, these first four properties are just like properties we've seen before. They're primitives. We have, well, I, I stand corrected. Strings are actually object references, but in some ways they act like primitives. All right, but we have strings which we've dealt with before. We have a Boolean which we've dealt with before. The big difference in this example is we now have an array list. And we have an array list because that's really what an order consists of, is a list of pizzas. My order for pizza, when it's delivered, means that a pizza goes to a customer. All right? So we have um, a list of um, pizzas, and it's represented by an array list. Does anyone know specifically why we use an array list rather than an array? Right. With an array, you have to define how many elements are in the array. All right? And you can't expand it and you can't contract it. At least not easily. With an array list, an array list can be dynamic. In other words, when we start this out, there's nothing in the array list. Every time we add a pizza to that array list, then we expand the array list by one spot. All right? This syntax simply says, I have an array list. In the, in the, the, the 
slanted brackets or angled brackets or greater than a less than sign, however you want to call it. This specifies the kind of data we're going to be storing in the array list. And in our case, we are storing pizzas in the array list. We are storing, and again, when I, when I say pizzas, what do I mean? I mean we are storing object references to pizza objects. We're storing pointers to pizzas in the array list. If you don't put anything here, we do this. Then our array list could store any sort of object we wanted to. We could put any object we wanted to in our array list. And that's probably not a good idea, right? Because, you know, this order is pricing pizzas, you know. We can't sell an automobile when, you know, we can't put an automobile on an order for pizzas or, or, a, or any other sort of object. It's, it's a list of pizzas. So we need to specify that it is a list of pizzas. It's just like other attributes in that it's private, all right? We could have a set method for it, but we don't. Because typically when you think of an array list, you think of an array list uh, as adding one element at a time. In other words, if I was thinking of this, I would, you know, the person would explain the first pizza, I would type in the parameters for it in my UI, then press add to order or something like that. And what that would do is that would take those parameters from the UI, create a pizza object for it, then associate that pizza with this particular order. If I did have a set method for this, it would look like this. What do you think it would look like? Let me ask you that. Public void. set pizza list. What do you think the argument to this method would be? What type of data would it be? Well, remember, we're not, we're simply providing the numbers as an option. To allow people to say, hey, um, I want a number one pizza. This, another person could call in and say, I want, a, I want a large thin crust with no pepperoni. So the number is not a requirement. We're simply providing that as an option. Well, what is, the, what is the pizza list attribute? It's an array list of pizzas. So if I want to set that attribute, if I want to set the name, what am I going to do? I'm going to give it a string. If I want to set the phone number, what am I going to give it? I'm going to give it a string. If I'm going to set the address, I'm going to give it a string. If I'm going to set his delivery, it's going to be a Boolean. All right? So if I'm going to set this attribute, pizzas, I better give it an array list of pizzas. So that's what's going to be the argument. And then... I would simply say pizzas equals arg list. So we could have a set for that list. That would require us to create an array list in another class and then simply set all the pizzas, the list of all the pizzas, all at one time. We have an alternate way of adding pizzas to the list, and that is through the add pizza method. The add pizza doesn't go and add a list of pizzas. It just adds an individual pizza. How does it do that? It uses the built-in method in an array list to add. And what that will do is that will add a pizza in the next available space. So if there's no pizzas in the array list, it will add it to position 0. If there's one pizza, it will add it to position 1, and so on down the line.
Notice I don't have gets and sets for these things. I probably should. I should have gets and sets for, for name, phone, address, is delivery. And probably even for the pizza list. I didn't do that, if I remember correctly, in the interest of time. But we should have a get and set, and the get and sets here would look just like the get and sets that we had for the previous, uh, in the previous pizza case. We do have a method to calculate the, the total cost. And what's the total cost of the order? Well, if it's a pickup, it's simply the total cost of all the pizzas. If it's a delivery, it's the total cost of all the pizzas plus a $2 delivery charge. So, what do I have here? I default the total to zero. I loop through all the pizzas. So I'm going to set the subscript initially to zero. I'm going to do this as long as i is less than the number of elements in the pizza array list. Each time through the, through the, through the loop, I increment i by one. I grab the pizza, the next pizza in the list. So the first time through, I'm going to grab pizza zero. The second time through, I'm grabbing pizza one. The third time through, I'm grabbing pizza two. And then finally, I take and I add that pizza's calculate cost to the total. Again, notice how this works. The order does not need to know anything about the way pizzas are priced. All right? The order simply keeps a list of pizzas and then in turn asks each pizza in turn, what is your cost? It does a calculation, returns a calculation, and that result is added to the total list. So this loop is going to look at each pizza in turn. I'm not creating new pizzas, I'm simply grabbing the pizzas that are already on the list and grabbing a pointer to them. I'm asking what the total cost of that pizza is and I'm adding it to the total. Finally, if it is delivery, I'm adding $2 to the total, and then I'm returning the total. So let's look at the unit test, how this works. I create one pizza using these parameters. I create this pizza using the default. I output the amount for the two pizzas. I create a new order and I specify three arguments. A name, a telephone number, and an address. So which function does it call? It calls name telephone number address. It calls this one. And because I've given an address, because I've given the three strings instead of the two strings, it assumes that it is for delivery. I have another method here that has a string and a phone number only. And I have is delivery defaulted to false. So I create the order object that way. I then go through and I add those two pizzas I created to the order. Then finally I ask the order, what is the amount of the order? That's what loops through the pizza, checks to see if it's delivery, and comes up with the total amount of the order. All right. One thing I do in some classes, I, I do usually once or twice a semester, is I ask students, what about an example or the material or whatever are you really clear on and what do you find most confusing? I like to, because we have about five minutes left in class, what I like to do is cut that in half. And I like to form a list of the things about this that you find confusing. All right. 
Each of you, I, I would like each of you to, to name one thing. All right? But again, we might get repetitive. And if you pick the same thing as someone else, I'll just put a tick mark next to it. That will help me prioritize what we're going to cover. So what I like to do is, we've seen this example last time. We went over it with some more additional explanation, hopefully clearing up some of the things that you weren't sure about. But I could still see there being some confusion. So let's go around the room and let's form a list of the things about this example you find the most confusing. Let's just start up here. Uh-huh. Okay. The The sequence of pizza versus customer info. All right. Good question. Um, ultimately, the answer is it really doesn't matter as long as you have all of it before you price the order. Um, and yeah, you probably would, especially because if you were um, calling up, you know, chances are like they might identify you by your phone number. They might already have your customer information. All right. But we'll put that on there and maybe we can talk more. That, that deals with more the manner in which the test object was created. Remember, the unit test is kind of throwaway code. You're writing it to test your classes. It's not meant to be great code. Later on when you write the UI, then you'll decide the process that it goes through and how those objects are going to be hooked together. All right, second row. Questions? Looping? OK. OK. And naming conventions. OK. We'll put a second check mark by it. All right, third row. Let's start down there. OK. Default constructor. Could you repeat that? The sec and looping? OK. So we have a second looping. OK. Next. If you say nothing, then you're going to teach the class on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK. OK, next. OK. OK, next row. OK. Um, in a nutshell, it's simply to provide more flexibility, that you could do it one way or do it the other way. Um, but we, we, can go, we can spend more time going over that. All right, that is all of that row. Last row. OK, so another vote for array list. Um, last row. OK, fair enough. And then last but not least. I have to double up on looping and array list. OK. But then just also just kind of understanding, uh, I guess, the syntax of a whole lot of it and just kind of learning the language in and of itself. OK. Depending on how everything kind of okay. together. But I mean, it's all just you know, learning. OK. Is there specific statements that are, are problematic? You you'd mentioned looping already. Okay. I guess a lot of that has to do with, with how uh, it's expressed or, or um, how, how we're using verbiage 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. Repeat. Oh, May. Okay. Okay. All right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Um, that largely is a UI thing, and um, we don't really, again, we haven't talked about UIs here. We're using our sort of our, our uh, test class, our unit test as a substitute UI. So we really haven't talked about that because we haven't talked about UIs. You could consider the unit test as sort of being a UI. Anything else? I'm going to take a photo of this so I remember. Hopefully, also, this won't get thrown away, so I can just bring it back up. But in case it does get thrown away, I want to have a photo of this, sort of as a souvenir. <laughs> I thought I could do it. I could, but I, I would be afraid of blocking it. Well, my big head's blocking it anyhow. Let's see. There we go. All right, smile. All right, so uh, I'll post this and we will explore this. This is kind of, uh, the reason I'm taking a lot of time on this is this is sort of bringing up, this is, this is good review of the stuff that we've gone over so far and it is really new concepts as far as like the pointers and, and all that go. So it's important sort of that you understand um, it going forward. Other questions? All right, we'll see you up in lab.